Well, we're starting a new series this morning. It's, a, it's going to be a, a short series, but we're going to be talking about what I'm titling Comfortable Sin. And you may go, what is that? What is Comfortable Sin? Well, let me try to explain. According to one dictionary, the definition for comfortable is to be undisturbed. There, there are some sins that I don't think very many people would argue with are just wrong, right? There, there, there are some things that are just really bad. Some things that we go, yeah, no question about it. That's something that we don't want anything to do with. People don't debate it. Stuff like, you know, uh, serious stealing, murder, abuse, physical abuse, domestic violence, those kind of things. We, we don't debate those things. Even people that wouldn't consider themselves church folk would say, yeah, those are bad. They may not call them sin, but they would say that those things aren't things that we should be doing. They're, they're not comfortable for any of us. They're disturbing right? There's other sins, on the other hand, that we kind of put in a different category. Uh, they're not quite that bad. They're, you know, we would admit if we were pressed, yeah, yeah, it's not good, but certainly not like those big ones. Certainly not murder and stealing and domestic violence, those kinds of things. They, they, they wouldn't fall in the category of big sins. We might even call them little sins. They're kind of really not that significant. And since most people are guilty of committing them, if we're honest, we're kind of comfortable with them. I mean, they don't disturb us that much. They're, they're like I said, kind of minor. And so we just kind of learn to live with them. But should that be the case? Should, should there be these categories of sin in some that we actually find aren't all that disturbing to us? That we're kind of comfortable with just because they're common? Or because they don't seem like they're that big of a deal because we can't get arrested for one? So, over the next several weeks, that's what I want to look at. I want to look at some of these sins that I think that if we're not careful, we can become comfortable with. They don't disturb us like the biggies. And our goal is to look at them through the filter of God's word. It doesn't really matter what I have to say. It matters a whole lot what God has to say. And I think linking it to what we have just talked about, the reality is that God is not out there waiting for us to sin, whether it's a biggie or a, what we consider a minor one, waiting to stop on us. These things are sin because they are opposite of God's character. And they separate us from His goodness, which He wants for us. So God's desire is not to punish or to drop the foot, so to speak. His goal is for our best. So let's keep that in mind as we go through these together. We might get a little uncomfortable as we unpack some of these, because they may be things that we have, if we're honest, come to think are kind of not that big of a deal. I think what we'll discover is they're a bigger deal than we think they are. So this morning, we're going to look at what I'm calling acceptable lies. What are these acceptable lies, and how can we understand this a little bit better? Well, be, before we get into that, let me give you a little story to kind of lead into it. Um, some of you, most of you, I think, probably know that not only am I a pastor, I'm the son of a pastor. I grew up in a pastor's home. And there's a lot of good things with that, and there's a lot of things that aren't so good. And a lot of people think that pastor's kids should be like a notch above every other kid. Well, let me tell you, that's just not reality. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we struggle with, my, my siblings and I struggle with growing up, pastor's kids is not going to church. That wasn't, really wasn't a big deal. We liked our church and we liked the people in our church. What the
bother them was my parents would have to stay after services to talk to me, which meant that we were there sometimes really long, and especially if it was nighttime, you know, because you, you just wanted to go home. So those things were really hard on us. And I remember one time I was, I was little, seven, eight years old. And I remember the church uh, we were in, and my dad was talking with people, and I was kind of bored, and there was no other kids around to play with, and so I just started roaming the church, and I walked into the church kitchen, and just like any kid, curious, I opened up the refrigerator door, and there inside the door, there was only one item that I remember, and it was a bottle of grape juice. Now, I don't think I was thirsty before I opened that refrigerator door. But all of a sudden, I began to get thirsty for grape juice. And I decided, man, that, that looks really good. So I shut the door, and I made my way back out to where my dad was talking. And I said to him, hey, dad, there's a bottle of grape juice in the refrigerator. Can I have some? And he looked at me and he said, no, son. That is for communion. So leave it alone. That is not the answer I wanted to hear. Then he said this, which I really didn't want to hear. There's a water fountain around the corner. Just get water. I didn't want water. I wanted grape juice. So I left the scene where my dad was, and I was walking begrudgingly toward the water fountain. But to get to the water fountain, you had to pass the kitchen again. So I decided I wanted one more look at the grape juice in the refrigerator. So I opened up the refrigerator again, and there it was, this ice cold bottle of grape juice. And it was almost like it was talking to me at this point. Come on, Andy, just one step. Nobody will ever know. You know how good it's going to be. And as I stood there staring at that grape juice, I convinced myself that all I want, I didn't want to drink like half the bottle, I just wanted to sit. And so I reached inside, I looked around, made sure nobody was around, I unscrewed the top, boom, took a quick swing, looked around again, boom, took another quick swing, looked at the bottle, noticed that there really wasn't that much gone, put the top back on, slid it back into the refrigerator, shut the door. That was great. That was that was so good, nobody saw me, I'm good to go. Satisfied, I walked back out to where my dad was, and what he said to me shot me right down into my socks. He looked at me and he said, son, I thought I told you not to drink that grape juice. I thought to myself, there's no way you could possibly know. I look, nobody was around. This must be some kind of a trick to see if you can catch me confessing to what he knows or doesn't know, I did. And so I looked at him and I said, I didn't drink the grape juice now. <laughs> and then he said to me, don't lie to me. I know you did. And stupidly, I said, no, Dad, I didn't drink the grape juice. And he said to me, we'll talk about this when we get home. Now, I don't know how you grew up, but when my dad said, we'll talk about this when we get home, that was code for, you're going to get lickings. <laughs> so when we got home, that's what I got. And I was just dumbfounded. How on earth did dad know? How did he figure this out? There's, I looked. Nobody was around. So the next day, I went to the place and said, dad, how did you know I he said, that's easy. You had a great mustache. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Nobody had to teach me how to lie. I don't ever remember a teacher, a parent, a sibling sitting me down to say, man, someday you're going to need to know how to lie. So let me tell you how to do it. Somehow I knew how to do it. And I got a hunch you probably did too as a kid. I got a hunch that I'm not the only liar in this room. There's probably a lot of us. And here's the thing. 
as we grow, we get better at it. We get more cautious of who and how and all those different things. But we become liars. And the reality is, nobody had to teach us that's part of what scripture describes as the depravity of the human heart. We are drawn toward things that are wrong. And then to try to make ourselves look good, we'll do things like relabel these ideas, right? I mean, think about it. We like to not call it a lie if it's not a, you know, it's not a walker. We call it a fin. Right? It's not a big lie. It's just a little white lie. Right? I didn't really lie. I stretched the truth. Do you see how we start becoming comfortable with doing something that the Bible calls sin? And that's what I want to zero in on this morning as, as we move through this very quickly. Quickly, first of all, what is the truth about God and lies? And here it is. Number one, God can't lie. We saw this when we went through our study in Titus just recently. In Titus 1-2, it says this. This truth, talk about the gospel. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. God can't lie. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, it says it's impossible for God to lie. Listen, somebody says, well, is there anything God can't do? Yes, God cannot not be God. God cannot do anything that's opposite of who he is. He can't go, he can't not be loving because God is love. He can't not be just because God is just. He can't be weak because he's almighty. And he can't lie because God is the truth. And listen, you and I need to be happy about that. We need to be happy that God can't lie. Because if God could lie, if there was any possibility at all that God could lie, we'd never know for sure if his promises were true. Do you realize that? If God said, if Jesus said, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Well, that's a great promise, isn't it? That if we put our faith and hope in what Jesus did on the cross to take our sin away, we can have eternal life. What a great promise. But if there's any possibility that God can find, we can't be sure that that is true. He might change his mind. He might be lying to us. So it's a great thing to know that God cannot lie. Here's number two. God hates lying. Not only can he not lie, he hates lying. Proverbs 12, 22 says this. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. So we might look at lies as no big deal, even what we call little lies or white lies or fibs or however you want to define it, we might look at it as no big deal, but the Bible says that God detests that, hates that. From the passage that Julia just read a minute ago, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, let's begin what it says, there are six things the Lord hates. No seven things he detests. Let me stop there for a minute because you might go, why is it really different? That's, that's a Hebrew way of getting your attention. When, when, when we wrote in Hebrew to start off like, hey, there's six things. No, actually, let me tell you, there's seven things. That was supposed to get the reader's attention. Whoa, this is a big deal. What are these seven things that God hates or detests? Haughty eyes. What's that? Oh, you think you ought to act. Lying tongue. There it is. Hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong. Here it is again. A false witness who pours out lies. A person who sows discord in a family. Look, out of the seven things it says that God hates, two of them have to do with deceit, have to do with lying. It's a big deal to the God of truth when we're deceitful. But say he hates that. What's that mean? To hate something is to mean you, you don't want anything to do with it. You want to be separated from it. You want to, you want to put yourself in an opposite direction of whatever that is. And that's the future. So again, we need to be very careful 
there are certain things, certain lies that we look at, and the life may not have to be a big deal. They're a big thing. You're talking about a God that can't lie. You're not talking about a God that hates So who do we lie to when we lie? Just real quick. Of course, we lie to others. Depending on the study you made, it would appear that the average person lies one to two times per day. It's the average. That means that there's some people that lie more, and maybe some people that lie less. But on the average, one to two times a day. You might think, well, that's really good. That yeah, is a great Well, something that, let's take the lower end of the scale. If you only lie once a day, you know, we're not talking about the lovers. We're talking about the fibs, right? The white lies. We're talking about the little ones. If you only did that once a day, well, that's seven times a week. That's 365 times a year. In five years, that's 1,820 lies. In 10 years, that's 3,650 lies. In 70 years, that's 25,550 lies. So one lie a day adds up. <laughs> Here's the thing we really need to focus on. If you steal, what would they call you? How many times do you have to steal to be a thief? If you commit adultery, what do they call you? An adulterer. How many times do you need to commit adultery to be an adulterer? Once. If you lie, what does that make you? A liar! How many times do you need to lie in order to fall into the category of a liar? So this liar is looking at a bunch of other liars. If we're honest. Now, none of us want to add up how much we lie. But guys, I've got some sad news for you this morning. There's some other studies that show that men tend to lie twice as much as women. And, and men lie usually to make themselves look better. And women lie because they want the other person to feel better. So we even lie for different reasons, right? And sometimes lying, we, we don't think we do it that much, but sometimes it just becomes automatic. I don't know if you've ever had this experience several years ago. We have this, I don't know if you guys have one of these, we have this kind of caddy in our shower that holds different things. It hangs off the, the shower area. And, uh, you know, there's stuff in it, mostly the ways of stuff. But anyway, there's stuff in it. And I was in a hurry one day, getting ready for something, and I hit this caddy, and out popped this razor. And it fell out of the caddy, hit the tub, and the, the razor head popped off the hand. And so I'm like, oh my goodness. I pick this thing up, I'm trying to put the head back on the handle, and I can't quite see what I'm doing. And I'm I'm in a hurry. I don't have time for this. And I noticed there's two other razors in that caddy anyway. She doesn't need a third razor. And so I took the razor and I threw it in the trash. And I went on my way. I mean, she has to go. It's no big deal. She's like, no. Several days later, she comes to me and she says, hey, um, have you seen my razor? It was, it was, in, that, it was in that basket, that caddy thing. I, folks, I didn't even have to think about it. It wasn't like I planned this out. I, I wasn't expecting this was coming, so I had taken days to figure out what I was going to say. It just automatically came out of my mouth. No, I don't know where it is. Then she said something like this, are, are you sure it was brand new and it, it was in that caddy? That was my opportunity, but again I said, I don't think I know where it is. See, I softened my lie a little bit. I, I don't think I know. And in case you're wondering, yes, several days later, I confessed to her. And I bought her a new razor, by the way. 
Well, what is that? What? Why would that be so quick just to come out? Well, I, I didn't want myself to look bad. I was afraid how she would react. I'm stupid. I'm a sinner. Take your pick. And, and, and I think if you were honest with all with all that, sometimes it's just because our nature is that way, it just happens. So we lie to each other. Here's number two, we lie to God. You say, wait a minute. <laughs> that would be really dumb. I mean, who'd be that dumb to lie to God? Let me share a quick story with you. It's in Acts chapter 5, if you want to look the whole thing up later. The church was brand new, and it was just exploding, and there were all kinds of cool things happening. And one of the neat things that was happening was that people in the church were coming together, and they were wanting to take care of the people in the church that didn't have as much. And so they were doing things like selling properties and different things, and then they were taking the money, and they were giving it to the needy people in the church. It was a beautiful thing. It wasn't mandatory. Nobody said they had to do it. It was just because they were so overwhelmed with God's love that they wanted to love on each other. And there was this couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. And they saw this happening. And they saw that people were just overwhelmed with the generosity that others were. And they were, you know, just, wow, this is amazing. And so they decided they wanted in on the act. And so they, the Bible says they took a piece of property that they owned and they sold it. And they brought the money to the leaders of the church. Now, here's the problem. The problem was they had decided, let's give them part of the money, but we'll tell them it's all of the money. So for instance, let's say they sold whatever it was for $100. They said, let's give 50, but we'll tell them that that's how much we got. And we're giving it all. You go, why would they want to do that? Because they wanted the pat on the back. And they wanted the accolades. And they wanted the people to go, oh, you guys are so generous. You're so good. Now, people like don't do that now in the church. But back then, that's what they struggled with. They, they wanted that family. So they went and they brought this money to the leaders of the church, claiming it was all, but it really wasn't all. Peter, who was one of the leaders of the church, confronts them. He says this in verse 4. The property was yours to sell or not sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. He said, wait a minute. They, they, didn't, they didn't tell God. They didn't do this to God. Well, here's why. Peter said this. Scripture is very clear that the church, you and I, we're called in the Bible the body of Christ. What does that mean? That means Jesus is in here right now. We sang about him today, and, and we sang about the great things that he does, but physically speaking, we, we shouldn't expect to see Jesus walk through the door today. He will one day break over the clouds and come. But physically, he's not here. But he lives within his believers, the church. And so to be called the body of Christ means that we're his physical representation until he comes back. So to lie to the church or to the leaders of the church, the implication here, that's like lying to God. I was thinking about this, and maybe you're like me. Maybe you've lied to God before when you sing. Hey, what are you talking about? See, singing is supposed to be an act of worship. It's supposed to be our heart toward God, right? It's supposed to do a number of things. It's supposed to be us praising and lifting up God and enjoying Him. Sometimes in, in worship, we also get convicted about something that's going on in our life that God reveals during that time of worship because we feel his presence. All kinds of different things happen. But a lot of times those lyrics in the song are kind of like, like prayers to God. And we sing something like this. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Lord, I live for you alone. We 
realize how serious it is to say that to God and yet not really do it? I, I know sometimes I don't. How about this one? I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Do I? Do you? Can we really sing those words honestly and say, God, I've given you every, everything, God. Even my checking account. My children. And again, I can't speak for you, but I know sometimes I've caught myself singing some of those things going, my heart's not there. This is not true. I've had to See, folks, if we're honest, we lie to God. We lie to others. And here's number three. We lie to ourselves. Listen to Galatians 6 3. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. The word in the original is literally deceiving. You're only deceiving yourself. You're only lying to yourself. You're not that important. Look, if you think you're all that, guess what? You're not. And you're only deceiving yourself. You are lying to yourself. You are no better than the next guy. We are all image bearers of the creator who made us. No matter what color our skin is, no matter how much money we have, no matter what our age is, no matter where we live, no matter what our mental capacity is, if you are human, you've been made in the image of God, you're no better than anybody else. If you think you are, you're only lying to yourself. That's what this is. Just a few verses down in verse 7 of Galatians 6, it says this, don't be misled. Again, the words deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't lie to yourself. You can't mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Folks, that, that is such an incredible passage of Scripture. We do things sometimes, and we know it's wrong, and we think, oh, nothing happened. So we do it again. And we do it again. And what the Scripture says, look, if you think that God is not just, and He's going to call you to that, you're only lying to yourself, we say. It's going to come home. James 1, verse 22, it says this. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, listen, you are only fooling yourself. Again, deceiving yourself. Lying to yourself. If you listen to the word and you don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what they look like. It's, it's really kind of an interesting illustration, isn't it? He says, look, if you're hearing the word, but then you're walking away and you're not doing it, and you think you're okay, you're just lying to yourself. It's like looking in the mirror, and your hair's all messed up, and you got hot butter running out of your nose and everything else, and you go, oh, whew, and you walk away, and you think you look great. The only person you're fooling is yourself. The only person you're lying to is yourself. Everybody else knows the hypocrite that you are. So we lie to ourselves. First John 1 John 1.8 says, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Hey, I'm not that bad of a God. Yes, you are. That's why we need Jesus. And if you think you're not that bad of a God, the only person you're deceiving is yourself. That's what it's saying. See, before you can get saved, you need to realize you're lost. Before you can come to Christ for salvation, you need to realize you need salvation, that you don't measure up to God. That's where it's at. And so you do that, the only person you're deceiving is yourself. See, addicts do this all the time, right? We talk about addicts living lives of deception. They deceive others. They end up deceiving themselves. They, just, they say things like, I can quit anytime I want. And every, anybody that knows and lives with them knows that, that that isn't the case because it's not happening. Well, I only had one. You know, well, there's no way one would have done everything that's implied that you're doing. 
I only take it to relax. Right? Those are all things that deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves in marriage, right? It's all hurtful. It's all his fault. I mean, if they would just get it right, everything would be okay. We don't want to face the reality. We don't want to look in the mirror and see, hey, I'm part of this deal too, and I'm contributing to this thing. But we'll, we'll fight hard for our own deceit. We, in, in today's world, we call it our own reality, our own truth. It's just a, a nice way of saying you're living a lie, and you're deceiving yourself. The worst kind of self-deception is when a person lies to himself about their standing with God. And again, it sounds something like this. I'm okay. I think I'm all right. And see, you've heard me say this before, but it's so true, folks. If I look around this way, I can always find somebody who's a little worse than I am and make myself look good. And when I find that person, I go, well, at least I'm not as bad as they are. I'm doing pretty good. But, but the reality is that's not what the, where the measure goes. The measure doesn't go this way, it goes this way. And I come up short every single time. Because I'm a liar. I'm, I'm willing to admit that. I'm also willing to admit that you're liars too. But the question is, will you admit it? I'll admit that I'm a liar. Guess what? That makes me fall short of the perfection of the holy God who created me. Which means I need a savior means I'm not in good standing. And the greatest self-deception of all is the person who thinks that they're good enough to stand in the presence of a holy God on their own. And you can't. You can't without Jesus. So why do we lie? Very quickly, I'm just going to run through these really fast. I'm going to give you the secondary reasons first, and then the primary reasons. Here's the secondary reasons. I, I like to protect myself, right? Uh, no, I don't know where the razor is. Protecting myself. Why? Because I don't want to get my wife yelling at me because I threw the razor. I'm, uh, I'm avoiding conflict. Um, not avoiding harm necessarily because I don't think she'd beat me up, but you know. Um, usually I lie because I want to protect myself or I want to protect others. I don't want to say something that's going to hurt their feelings. So, how do you think this makes me look? And we don't tell them the truth because we don't want to hurt their feelings. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't say that we don't like certain things because we're trying, really trying to protect their feelings. And I wonder how many times we're really trying to protect the other person's feelings or again, avoid some kind of conflict because it's uncomfortable for me. I, I lie because I want to hurt somebody. I mean, let's be honest. There are times that people lie because they want to hurt the reputation of the other person. We want to, we want to make them feel bad because something that's been done to us by them, maybe in the past, made us feel bad, and so we lie about them, make them hurt. We want something. We just want it. And so in order to get it, I think I've got to lie. Right? I want the tax return, so I'm going to have to fudge on how much I made last year. Or I'm going to put in extra things that I gave to as far as charity, or whatever the case might be, but I want to get something out of it so I've got a lot. And ultimately, again, to make myself look good. I, I want to look good in front of other people, and so, um, you know, I'll, I, it's not like full on, it's just a little bit, I just make the story sound a little bit better than it really was, because I want to look good. Those are secondary reasons. Here's the primary reason. When I really stop and think about it, when I lie, it's because I think the lie is better than the truth. Folks, that's the bottom line. When we lie, we have been convinced that the lie is better than the truth. Or we wouldn't do it. I mean, why lie if, if the truth is better, right? But when we come to that point where we say, well, I just need to tell a lie here, a fib, a white lie, stretch the truth, whatever you want to call it, we are convinced that that is better than the truth. Listen to what Jesus said, John 8, 44. He's talking about Satan. He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning. He always hated the truth because there's no truth in it. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, 
For he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I lie, what am I doing? I'm believing Satan's lie. That the lie is better than the truth. You want to know why God hates lying? Because it's a lie that started the whole mess in the first place. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when Satan tempts Eve. It's the lie that traps her. She believed the lie. And so of course God's going to detest that because it messed everything good up that he made. And so when you and I fall prey to telling lies or we're telling the truth, we, we convince ourselves that somehow the lie is better than the truth. Just like Eve was convinced, somehow this lie has got to be better than the truth. What Satan's handing me has got to be better than what God did. Jesus said, man, don't be fooled by this guy. He's a murderer. He's a liar for the evil. When I lie, I think that this lie is better than the truth. I, I think, for instance, I'm going to be more secure. If I, if I tell this lie to this person, it's, it's going to create security. And in actuality, it's not going to make me more secure. Now I've got to worry if they're going to find out about my lie on top of whatever it was I lied about. So it doesn't make me secure. I think that the lie is better than the truth because if you don't like me more, the problem is a solid relationship is built on truth. So if I continue to lie, I have a very shaky relationship at best that is bound to crumble sometime when the lies are discovered. So the very thing that I want and desire, the lie is keeping me from. But somehow, I've been convinced that the lie is better than are, are you catching where I'm going here? So how do we defeat this deceit? How do we get beyond this? You're in. Okay, I get it. I'm a little uncomfortable. Good, because that's the very first thing. Get uncomfortable with lies. Stop telling yourself it's no big deal. Tell, stop using other people's uh, propensity to lie as your excuse. Well, everybody does it, right? What, what is that doing? That's making you more comfortable. If you're not as uh, uncomfortable with it as you should. Get uncomfortable with it. We serve a God who can't lie. We serve a God who hates lies. And the truth, Jesus said, will what? Set you free. Set you free from what? From all the deceit that's going to take you down. Right? So start getting uncomfortable. Start, stop buying the lie. That there are certain lies that are okay. That you can get comfortable. Here's another two. Get closer to the truth. Capital T. Jesus made this statement in John 14, 6. Most of you guys are familiar with this. I am the way, the what? The truth. The life. No one comes to the life. Jesus is the embodiment of truth. What do we believe about truth? Well, we believe the truth is, it's not a creed, it's not a statement, it's not even a book. It's a person, the person of Jesus Christ. He's the truth. The closer I get to truth, the further I get from lies. So draw close to the truth and the lies that you are tending to tell they won't show up as often. Because your relationship with the truth will grow and grow. Here's number three. This perhaps is maybe the most difficult one. Get accountable to a brother or sister in Christ. Listen, we talked about encouragement last week. This is part of that encouragement. I may need you to help me become more honest in the way I think I know. But I can't get you to help me unless I am honest with you about the deceit I'm living. See why it's hard, but it's so important to find a brother or sister. Listen, that's one of the reasons 
um, that we have CR, celebrate recovery, and many ways. You say, well, it's all about lying? Well, not all about it, but it's a big part of it. Learning to live honestly before God and them about the hurts, habits, and hangups in my life. It's getting other brothers and sisters involved in encouraging you and helping you become whole like you need. In the very least, you need a brother or sister in Christ that you trust that you can go to and say, look, I just, I gotta be honest with you, I'm struggling with this. I don't know how I've gotten myself into this kind of pattern or habit. Would you help me? Could we meet on a regular basis? Could, could we talk about some steps that I need to take and do? The honest thing. You say, man, that's, that's really vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, it's called being real. It's called loving each other enough to do that with each other. You know, well, why did they go around and tell me that? Well, hopefully you're going to pick somebody that doesn't do that. And hopefully there's nobody in here that will do that. Because we understand how serious this is. We understand how much God wants us to be people of truth, who walk in the truth. Not, not just say that we believe this, but they will honest. Listen, folks. I call this message acceptable lies. There's really no such thing. It's perceived, it's our perception that they're acceptable. It's our perception that we can be comfortable with them. But we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be anything about dishonesty that we're okay. We serve the God 